Greetings and welcome to our first fireside for the Gatherverse Year Fired Summit, where we have Daniel Robbins, who comes to us from Adobe, who's a brilliant designer and a friend. Daniel, how are you? Thank you. Good morning. And uh, I wish that I could be with you in person. I met Christopher, I think, in 2017 when I visited a cool stage that he was helped setting up in the Bay Area. And I have just always been so um, filled with hope every time I see what Christopher does. Uh, he brings resilience, grit, energy. Uh, as the world goes up and down and up and down, Christopher keeps going up and he uplifts everyone in an amazing, inclusive way. So thank you for bringing that to the world. Thank you, dear Daniel. And you're very kind. And I do remember those times where we were building arguably the biggest holodeck in Silicon Valley many, many years ago and enjoying each other's company and enjoying the time with all that we had uh, to build with at such a time. It, 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 uh, audience, uh, by now, most of us, I, I'm going to assume Gatherverse community, that we've used technologies like Dolly 3 and Mid Journey and Firefly and other different types of generative uh, models of diffusion models, if you will, <clears throat> with Sora and other different um, video models, a runway, if you will. And, and there's more, uh, Daniel, as you know. I remember seeing some of the very first images of Mid Journey and Firefly and more. And it was extraordinary to see the capability of these design platforms and how disrupted they could be um, for the accelerated development of design. But as you and I know that truly AI can never replace the human ingenuity and creativity. But as we also know is that you can have art without technology, but you cannot have technology with art without art. And, and, and Daniel, I want to take it there for the moment to understand and have the audience to appreciate what does design mean fundamentally for technology, for innovation, for business in this AI era? So I like to think of in this era now of Gen AI as there being a a pyramid of how we think about how work is going to get done, creative work. Uh, at the top, there's going to be people who have amazing skills and talents uh, and want to want to augment those. They want to do more than they're already doing, uh, but they they ultimately they do have the skill to do everything they want to do. They just want to do more of it. Um, the next level down in the pyramid is going to be people who don't necessarily have those skills or don't have the time to do everything they want to do and want to scale their work to include things they can't currently do. Uh, I, I add myself to that bucket. I'm terrible actually at drawing. And so I love that these tools can do that. Or if you take something like a 3D task where, you know, maybe I really like making shapes, but I hate doing texturing. Or maybe I like making the scenery, but I don't like doing the animation. So I can be in partnership with one of these systems to do that. And then there's a much larger area, and I don't like bottom because it implies a hierarchy, but there's a much larger part of the pyramid, which is people who don't necessarily make creativity part of their work, but need to make artifacts and need to make things. Uh, and this edges over into automation, uh, where you have people who need to just make things at a tremendous scale. Uh, I think to get practical about it, what we need to think about is where is the job loss going to be? And I think there is going to be a large, not in the top tier, those people are, are always going to sort of have a defensible position, but there are going to be positions in the middle and the, and the bottom area where the, the conversation and the workload shifts enough toward the AI that honestly, we need fewer people to do that. So then the question is, okay, you're now out of a job. What do you do uh, as a creative person, as, as, as part of your soul? Daniel, what do we do though? I mean, and this is interesting. You just brought up just a, a quick example that I, I can't, I can't uh, uh, design as well or paraphrase, if you will. But but AI could do it for me if I could put it like that. What happens when these tools that are quite capable, as you and I know, and the Gatherers community, you know as well, what happens when we're using these tools in in the hands of a lay, layman, a laywoman that are using these tools and they know how to use it better? 
that a designer, or she has been designing for decades, Pixar on down and everywhere in between. Yeah. What is the general sentiment that we're getting from our design community? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Is there air, is there is there an air of optimism about? Uh, I would say it's it's mixed. It's heterogeneous. You've got some people with a tremendous amount of excitement and see this as a, a superpower uh, and a democratization of creativity, or or maybe we won't say creativity, a democratization of creation. Uh, maybe without creativity. Uh, and then there's people who feel a lot of angst and feel that we are losing a part of humanity by doing this. Uh, I tend to think of it as both and. Uh, personally, I come at it with, with multiple contradictory points of view. One is a, a selfish desire to be able to create things that I have a really hard time creating. You know, I wake up in the morning, I have these amazing things in my head, but it's so ponderous to, to put pen to paper, essentially, to bring them to the world. So anything that can help that is great. On the other hand, I do fully acknowledge, having been someone who's been out of work before, that it is demoralizing, it is uh, inequitable, it is uh, really hard to be at the, the, the blunt end of these sea changes. And this is happening much more rapidly than it's happened with other sea changes. That said, uh, I do look at the past uh, to learn from it. I remember, you know, when I was a kid and the rise of desktop publishing, there was tremendous angst about what's going to happen to to everybody else, you know, graphic designers, essentially. And what happened is, yeah, some graphic designers were put out of work and it enabled a ton of people to make really terrible flyers and posters and things like that. And you could say, oh, there was terrible stuff, but people were able to make something. And ultimately, that's the part I care about is that a larger number of people who can make something. I don't know who out there today, what child, what kid who doesn't have access to art classes, design classes, the, the capitalist machine is going to be able to use some future tool to make something that I can't even imagine. Uh, and I don't want to, to limit that, that possibility. And again, embracing contradiction, there are people right now who are out of work or will be out of work because there is, there is less for people with formal training to do. I remember there was a time when we were designing years and uh, quite some time ago, I'll, I'll date myself some, uh, and before the applications are real near the uh, applications era. And we we're part of the graphic artists guild. And it was a guild that was protecting artists and designers and creatives such as ourselves uh, for those that are working in industry and business. And you could be a contractor and have protection. You could work in a company and have some type of protection of your artistry, but I don't think that the graphic artist guilds of the world were necessarily prepared for the incoming wave, if you will. And it seems to me, Daniel, that some jobs will be disrupted in ways of earning income based on creativity. And some will never have the opportunity to come back again, such as the way of the world. And Russell Bundy just in our past roundtable, which is a fire of a roundtable discussion, simply brought up that there were those that were doing things by hands in the fields and the farming generation. And then along came a tractor and some people never went back the way again. Right. And some people learned how to fix tractors and some people, you know, were other parts of the chain. But yes, I, I completely want to acknowledge and be honest that disruption hurts. Is it best for an inspiring artist and designer? Because we do know that creativity, if you look at the art puzzles of the world and different, uh, venues of, of of distributed art assets if you will um they still there's still a market and it's still a, a, a multi-million dollar if not near billion plus in distributed art that's being sold around the world but be it as competitive as it's ever been is that the pursuit is that is that what we're telling our our 16 17 18 year olds or 10 year olds and saying this is the way to go if you want to work for pixar one day you could is that fair to say or should we guide them in another way? Or should we allow ourselves to be patient with the process of how this will evolve and to see what might come on the horizon in terms of new opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I, I hesitate to tell someone to, to follow their passion because their passion may take them to a place where they can't pay the rent. And in certainly in the country we live in, you know, rent and healthcare are are acute issues. And I would never want to uh to, to turn out a Pollyannish person who's not able to, to, to be on their own feet. 
Uh, but as I said, there's this pyramid and there will be people who have such skill and such talent and such drive that they will be able to find that place, whether it be at the Pixar or the Art Basel or something like that. That said, for, for the rest of us, because I don't put myself up at that Pixar level, um, I say that the thing to do is, is a kind of reinvention. Uh, you know, in the previous panel, we talked about training and stuff like that. Uh, I would caution a little bit on the training stuff. I would instead say, how can you find your own, you know, personal passion area and bend it slightly and, and find the narrative in it that does bring more appeal to the current job market? Uh, you know, I don't want to say that we're products and we need to market ourselves. It's more about storytelling. And so if I'm talking to a kid and I'm saying, you know, what do you want to be in the future? I would say, okay, what areas do you, what are you really passionate about? And then what maps to that, uh, that won't be as likely to be disrupted? You know, like my, I have a 14 year old son and right now, you know, and his opinions may change right now. He wants to be a firefighter. I'm like, awesome. You know, that's not going to be disrupted for a long time. Uh, whereas my daughter's 18, you know, talks about being a lawyer someday. It's like, I don't know, you know, be very careful which part of that you, you navigate. So back to the kid, you asked, what do we tell the kid who's drawing rocket ships uh, and they, they want to go forward with that? And I say, OK, figure out which part of that that pyramid you play in in an honorable way, in a way that really uh, uses your, your talents, but be very pragmatic about it. Uh, again, uh, being being a, a human being in the world and we want to bring everyone's soul, but we also got to pay the rent. <laughs> Exactly. And as far as our firefighters, our first responders who we care for a lot uh, with the Gatherverse community, I can easily candidly see a robot running and, and justified running it to a house full of flames as opposed to a first responder. And it seems to me here they're doing their level best to be able to build that quickly. Uh, Daniel, let, let's let's kind of switch gears for a second. Sure. The relationship between the artist, the designer, the human and the loop, if you will, and the robot. It's now the human and the machine. And, and in fact, you can almost do attribution with that. <laughs> Made by the human and the machine. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that for a second, that relationship, this evolving relationship. Because a lot of times we, we don't really consider what's happening to our own creative engines by use of these applications. Might we be leveling our own selves up by using these AI platforms, when it comes to what's being rendered, how to use it, we've never taken the, this much information direct specifically at any given time based on a tool that's available. Now, every day, perceptual sciences, we're perceiving the world and learning every day, every moment, every second, our eyes are open or our senses are active, if you will. But in terms of actually using a machine and intaking this information, even the creative display of an information on video and mobile, might this provide an opportunity in the creative sense for the artistic community to come together of a cloud consensus and say that not only do we have these models, but we can champion and develop prospectively a new entire industry and way of thinking when it comes to deployment of design. Is that fathomable in your mind? Yeah, definitely. And and I see this as uh, being a threat across lots of activities from the practical of getting a job uh, and having informational interviews all the way to having a conversation with an AI agent that is helping you make a, a an artifact, a creative artifact. Uh, I think what it takes is a kind of intentionality and curiosity. So when I'm in conversation with one of these AIs and, you know, and I'm being very generous when I say conversation right now, uh, I am using it not necessarily for it to create something, but for it to help me figure out what I really want to do and what I want to make. And for, you know, if it presents me a lot of visual alternatives or text alternatives, I am using those to, to filter my own thinking and my own desires and to learn more about myself. So, you know, in a, and I really am trying to tie these two threads together of, you know, job finding in this, this pretty difficult time with being a creative person. When you're out there on the market and you're talking to people, it is not just about storytelling. It is not just about putting yourself forward. It is also about using every opportunity, every person you meet as a mirror to learn about yourself uh, and to figure out, you know, as an artist, as a creator, as a provider, which aspects of myself do I want to accentuate and which parts are going to be in my back pocket for a while till the world might be, be different. Likewise, when I'm working with these very, still very primitive systems, these creative systems, 
I'm deciding which parts of my tool chain, which parts of my workflow, is this actually going to help? And which parts is it actually just taking me off track? Uh, you know, when we when we think about when we step back from some of these systems, we think, what are the different uh, areas that we need to work on? There's obviously quality. You know, are there six fingers on the hand, uh, or five? You know, however many. And then there's control. Is the hand where I want it to be? And then there's integration, which is something we don't talk about a lot. Which is how can I take items from the real world, things that are really important to me, and integrate them with the output of these? And that's where that conversation comes back into into play. Daniel, so that was a long answer to your short question. But it was a great answer. With our final question here, uh, it comes, it comes, it goes, it 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 leaves as quick as it as it arrived. Uh, Daniel, what will you say to the thousands of people that are attending with us today, uh, whether we're rebroadcasting in Meta or um, Google Campuses, if you will, or Linux Foundation, our friends, or HP? In the entire Gatherverse global community, what would you say to the designer, to uh, the leading designers, the artists, the those that have a desire to to create and, and to innovate with this looming threat, if you will? What are your words to them? Well, the first one, <clears throat> you know, with thousands of years behind it, is compassion, uh, compassion for yourself, compassion for the world. Uh, this kind of change does create anxiety, so please have compassion for everyone around you understand that most of us at these companies are trying our best to make these things in ethical and equitable ways uh, while understanding that it does create change. Have compassion for yourself. If you come home at the end of the day and you're just exhausted from trying to keep up with everything. Uh, I have never seen a time in my 30 year career in technology where even the researchers, the, the PhD researchers can't keep up with all the developments. So again, if I boiled it down to one thing for the creatives in the house, it's please have a lot of compassion. Once you have that, once you're calmer and you're able to acknowledge that, then you can shift into curiosity and start learning more. Uh, but that is the, t the this is the time. As it was expressed to the, some degree that some of this isn't new in terms of industries and whole entire ecosystems of operations changing. But suffice it to say, none of us have never been this way before. Uh, Daniel, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your leadership and guidance on this subject and our gather was well. Thank you. And uh, one last word is if you are someone out there who is interested in upping your, your game in the design world, maybe you're going through a career transition, uh, feel free to reach out. I, I can't give everyone my time, but I certainly would love to, I learn from everyone I talk to. So thank you very much. I suggest everyone that listened to that take advantage if you have a desire to be able to work with an expert uh, and a friend from Adobe and a friend and a community member of Gatherverse. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. And coming up next, we have an incredible roundtable discussion, AI, the enemy of human productivity, led by Lin Jitao. Mayor Gather, be well. <laughs>